In this series, we'll go over some of the more lesser known cards that would probably never appear in the other types of videos, or just talk about them in different ways than you might expect. The first card in today's episode of the Unknown Side is Seismic Crasher, a level 3 Earth Rock monster that has a pretty subpar stat line of 1400 attack and 300 defense. This card also has an effect that's twice per turn, where you can send one continuous spell or trap card you control to the graveyard to deal 500 points of damage to your opponent. The effect has a specific wording of twice per turn because it could be abusable, like other non-once per turn staples. But the effect of Seismic Crasher isn't why this card is on today's episode of the Unknown Side of Yu-Gi-Oh! Seismic Crasher is on this episode because of its artwork and weird case with its errata. An errata in general is essentially an error in printing or writing, which is corrected in later editions of whatever text it's part of. In Yu-Gi-Oh! it's kind of the same idea, except like they change things for a lot of other reasons too. There are three broad categories of erratas in Yu-Gi-Oh! which are lore, name, or other. Lore is essentially changing interactions within an archetype, whether that be including or excluding cards, correcting mistakes, updating flavor text, simply effects or mechanical changes. Then there's name erratas, which aim to correct misspellings, or the most well-known change, censorship, because in the West, Yu-Gi-Oh cards can't have religious symbols, guns, violence, or sexual content shown on them. The last category of erratas is other, which encompasses correcting mistakes or updating terminology, and the most common example is the big change from magic cards to spell cards back in the day. And erratas are somewhat rare in Yu-Gi-Oh, but when they do occur, it's not world shattering. But with the case of Seismic Crasher, it is a bit more noteworthy than other cases. So, before its release, Seismic Crasher was previewed in a V-Jump magazine. The preview showed the card in a completely different outfit and position, but then when Seismic Crasher was released, it had a completely different artwork, which is the version you see nowadays. But when this was noticed and commented on by players, Konami did a first and actually apologize for the Rada, which is something that Konami does once in a blue moon, if ever. So the fact that Konami made a full apology for a relatively minor artwork change is pretty surprising. The reason for the change wasn't really expressed by Konami, so your guess is as good as mine as to why it happened. Another fun fact about the artwork of Seismic Crasher is that his two blades share the same border colors as spell and trap cards. So the artwork pairs well with its effect because of Seismic continuous spell and trap relation. And today's video is brought to you by Factor. Factor is a meal planning service that sends you complete meals. All you do is heat them up and they're pretty much good to go. With my workload managing six channels and streaming multiple times a week, cooking isn't really a priority, nor do I make enough time to do it. Factor's no hassle prepared foods ensure I always have something nutritious when I don't have time to make lunch or dinner. It's also kept me on track as I continue my weight loss and strength conditioning. Factor makes it possible for me to achieve my daily goals through nutritious eating. The best part about Factor is that the Factor meals arrive pre-prepared and ready to eat in two minutes or less, even faster than ordering in. Meal plans offer variety with a rotating weekly menu of 27 plus meal options, and 33 plus add-ons like smoothies, keto shakes, desserts, and more. Use my link or go to gofactor75.com and use code pogduelfeb50 for 50% off your first box. And now, let's continue on the video with some more interesting fun facts about Yu-Gi-Oh! The next cards on this list are the Mechlord Emperor Trio of Mechlord Weasel, Skeel, and Grinnell. All three of these monsters are unique for boss monsters, being level 1 monsters. All three are machine type that have unique typing and stat lines. Weasel, the quote-unquote leader of the Emperors, is dark attribute and has 2500 attack and defense. Skeel is wind attribute and has 2200 attack and defense, and lastly, Grinnell is earth with zero attack and defense. The Mechlord Emperors have an archetypal effect with their own unique twists. The effect is that they can only be special summoned when a face-up monster you control is destroyed and sent to the graveyard by a card effect. They also have the archetypal effect to target one synchro monster your opponent controls and equip it to the Mechlord Emperor. Once equipped, the Emperor gains attack equal to the equipped monster's attack. Then, as I mentioned, each Mechlord Emperor has their own effect on top of that and even a different effect in the anime. The Mechlords were the main villain's boss monsters in the Yu-Gi-Oh! 5D series, the series that introduced synchros to the game, which made for some pretty interesting duels considering the whole archetype was designed around being anti-synchro. Although their anime counterparts had different effects that in some cases were actually worse than the real version counterparts, but we'll get into that in a second. It's pretty interesting to see the whole villain's archetype to counter the new mechanic of the series. Like, imagine in Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, where the fusion monsters really kicked off, if everybody ran Fusion Devour, Anti-Fusion Device, or Dimension Barrier, this series would definitely not have lasted as long as it did, or at least the duels would have been a lot less interesting. Regardless, the anime versions of the Mechlord Emperors are a lot different than their real-life counterparts. In the anime, each of the Emperors were a combination of five different cards, kind of like Exodia or Gate Guardian, but more viable. Because rather than just instantly winning, the duel still goes on with the Mechlord Emperors, and each of the components can swap out for each other, except for the core, which is the Mechlord Emperor itself. The different parts gave different effects based off which ones were being played. For example, there are the base parts that have no special effects like Weasel Attack, 
which is just a level 1 dark machine monster with 1200 attack and 0 defense that destroys itself if there isn't a mechlord emperor on the field. On the other hand, there's Skeel Attack 3, which is a level 3 wind monster with 1200 attack that has the effect that during your main phase, you can have the attack of a monster, but it cannot attack directly. Or there's Grenell Attack, which has the effect that if your Mechlord Emperor attacks a defense position monster, it can attack once again. So what would happen is that you would need to destroy all four other parts to destroy the core of the Mechlord Emperor, but each part has different effects that can be swapped in and out depending on the situation. But once the core, that being the central Mechlord Emperor, the rest of the pieces are destroyed. Starting with Mechlord Emperor Grenell, who also on top of the attack it gains from the archetypal effect, also gains attack equal to half of your opponent's life points. So summoning this early already shoots Grenell up to 4000 attack on summon. Pair that with the common synchro boss monster who sits at 3000 attack, you'll be getting quite the beat stake if you absorb it. Then Grenell can target one of the equipped monsters and special summon to your field in defense position, because the Artubal effect is just once per turn effect, you can easily have multiple monsters equipped to it over the course of a couple of turns. Emperor Grinnell actually saw some competitive play back in 2011 in a scrap deck and placed top 10 at a YCS Orlando, as Grinnell benefited from the dominance of synchros and how scrap monsters like to destroy themselves. But outside of that, Grinnell didn't see much other usage. Next is Mechlord Emperor Skeel, who was the Wind Mechlord Emperor. Apart from its archetypal effect, Skeel also allows it to send one monster equipped to the graveyard to allow Skeel to attack directly. With a stat line of 2200 in both attack and defense, with a potential bonus depending on the attack of the equipped monster, it's really nothing to scoff at. But the problem, and this isn't just with Skeel, you are relying on your opponent to have Syngra monsters to really profit from the effect. Skeel is definitely the worst of the three Mechlord Emperors because its effect is just to attack directly by losing the equipped Syngra monster, which isn't that good compared to its counterparts. Regardless, Skeel is still the second highest level 1 monster with 2200 attack, only behind its brother, Mechlord Emperor Weasel. Additionally, Skeel seems to share some similarities to the user of the card in the anime, that being Lester. Skeel is without a doubt the smallest and tiniest of the Mechlord Emperors from looking at the design, just like how Lester is the smallest of the three Emperors of the Elaster, who are the other two members of the villain trio who use the Mechlords. Another fun fact about Skeel is that it's the only Mechlord Emperor to be released not as a promo card, but in a TCG set. Weisel and Grinnell were both available as promo cards. The last of the Mechlord Emperors is Mechlord Emperor Weisel. This is the first Mechlord Emperor that's shown in the anime, and after the entire Earthbound Immortal arc, Weisel seems to be the opposite of them. With the Mechlords being futuristic menaces, while the Earthbound Immortals were ancient forces. In terms of effect, Weisel had the Mechlord Emperor archetypal effects, like the other Emperors, alongside a spell card negate. And what made Weisel a bit better and more viable was that this wasn't linked to its synchro absorption ability. The effect was just once per turn, quick effect, negate the effect of any one spell card that's activated and destroy it. The simplicity and the effectiveness of this card and the 2500 attack and defense stat line put Weisel ahead of its other Mechlord counterparts in both casual and competitive events. Mechlord Emperor Weisel saw high placements in both 2012 and 2014. The 2014 placement is pretty surprising given the popularity of XC's monsters at the time, but in combination with the control that Gravekeepers provided, Weisel was able to secure a top 5 placement. In terms of Weisel's raw stats, it's worth noting that Weisel is in fact a level 1 monster with the highest attack currently in the game at 2500 attack points. And, if it could be normal summoned, it would have the highest total combined attack and defense of the non-tribute normal and effect monsters at 5000, the next closest being Giant Kozaki at 4900, so it's pretty close between the two. Although it's not directly stated, the three mechlords can be seen as mind, body, and spirit. Grenell is the largest, so represents the body or ground, Skeel is airborne mechlord, which represents the spirit or sky, and last is Weisel, who looks pretty humanoid-like in comparison and represents the mind or humans. So there's some pretty interesting comparisons, and even with the design and lore, being all robotic and futuristic but holding core humanistic values. The next card on the list is Cypher Soldier, one of the few, if only, cards that's had attribute changes over its lifetime as a card, but we'll get to that in a second. But first, the basics. Cypher Soldier is a level 3 earth machine monster with 1350 attack and 1800 defense, with the effect that if it battles a warrior type monster during the damage calculation, Cypher Soldier gains 2000 attack and defense. Despite the niche effect when battling only warrior type monsters, the 2000 attack point gain is a pretty noticeable attack gain for any kind of monster. But that's not why he's on today's episode of the Unknown Side, even if it did see competitive play specifically because of that effect. The reason why Cypher Soldier is on this list is because it's one of the two cards that has switched attributes around. When Cypher Soldier was first released, it was originally given the Earth attribute. But then, in its next release, it was given the Light attribute randomly. Then afterwards, in its next release, it was changed back to Earth. And there isn't any particular reason for the change, or at least ones that Konami's themselves have confirmed. Cypher Soldier is just a really weird case with the attribute changes, and it's one of the few cards that has received this treatment. Cypher Soldier has also received five different erratas, with only two of them being significant. With the first errata being its attribute when it was changed back during its second errata, 
and then again with its fifth errata, changing its name from Kinetic Soldier to Cypher Soldier. And the last card on our list is Gen X Controller. Gen X Controller is a normal tuner dark level 3 monster with 1400 attack and 1200 defense. Gen X Controller is the main component of the Gen X archetype, but that isn't the best thing, as the Gen X archetype is infamously known as being one of the worst archetypes in the game, although there is some tough competition for this title. The archetype as a whole is a bunch of different machine monsters with different attributes that all have the same core tuner involved, Gen X Controller. Then, each of the synchro monsters are based on energy sources like hydroelectricity or geothermal. Later on, more support was released for the archetype with the R Gen X monsters, or Gen X ally monsters, but we'll get to them in a bit. But long story short, the support didn't even end up supporting the archetype itself. As I just mentioned, the Gen X archetype is one of the worst in the game, and there are a couple of key issues with why this archetype suffers. A big one is that the monsters focus around synchro summoning using the same tuner for the four main synchro monsters. The issue with the four different main synchro monsters is that they all specifically list Gen X controller as a material, which in itself isn't that bad. The issue is that the rest of the Gen X monsters have essentially no synergy to each other. For example, Gen X Gaia, which has the effect that if it would be destroyed, you can destroy a Gen X controller instead. The big issue with Gaia is that you'd rather lose Gaia than Gen X controller, because the Earth synchro monster of the Gen X, Gen X Geo, requires Gen X controller and just any other Earth monster. So realistically, Gaia is the more expendable option. Then there's Gen X Furnace, which is a level 5 pyro monster that if you control a face-up Gen X controller, you can normal summon Gen X Furnace without tributing. Konami felt so bad about the original Gen X cards that they wouldn't even allow Furnace to be special summoned. And the synchro monster that both monsters go into, Gen X Thermo, is a level 8 machine synchro with 2400 attack that gains 200 attack for each fire monster in your graveyard, and when it destroys a monster by battle, you can inflict 200 damage to your opponent for each Gen X monster in your graveyard as well. On the other hand, Gen X Undying is not terrible by comparison, where it searches for a Gen X controller by sending any other water monster for your deck to the graveyard, being one of the few Gen X cards to actually see competitive play for its foolish effect. This would all be barely excusable if the synchro monsters had some pretty strong effects attached to them, but the synchro monsters are not anything to write home about either. We've already talked about Gen X Thermal, but there is also Windmill, Geo, and Hydro. Windmill has 2000 attack and gains 300 attack for each face down spell and trap on the field, and can discard one card to destroy a face down spell and trap on the field. What's scary is that despite Windmill's effect that counters itself and has no synergy with the archetype because there's no Gen X spell or trap cards in the entire archetype, but it's still by far the best synchro out of the Gen X synchro monsters despite that. Then there's a Hydro Gen X that has 2300 attack, and when it destroys a monster by battle, you gain life points equal to its attack, which isn't the worst effect in the world but with 2300 attack, there isn't much you're able to destroy with it. The last is Geogen X, which has 1800 attack and 2800 defense, and has the effect to switch the attack and defense of Geogen X if you control a face-up level 4 or lower Gen X monster. If Geogen X had more than 3000 defense, then one could argue for its usage, but even at that point, having another level 4 or lower Gen X monster in the field is a pretty big liability to have for just a slightly high attack beat stick. Later on, some support was released for the archetype with two sub-archetypes, that being our Gen X and Gen X allies. The issue with the additional archetypes is they don't really support the core monsters of the archetype, Gen X controller, because, like the other main Gen X support cards, their effects have little to nothing to do with Gen X controller. But at least this time, there are three somewhat usable Gen X monsters that came out of the support, but not for their archetype. First being Gen X Neutron, which has the ability to search out any machine tuner from your deck during the end phase, which came into use with the occasional deck as a searching option, but it was during the end phase of your turn, so there wasn't really much to work with. Then there was Gen X Ally Duradark, which can select one face-up attack position monster opponent controls with the same attribute as itself and destroy it. This effect was used with BM4 Blast Spider, which has a little bit of a confusingly worded effect. But essentially, you can target one dark machine monster and one face-up monster opponent controls and destroy both of them. Then, if a monster that's original attribute was a dark machine destroys a monster and sends it to the graveyard, you can deal damage equal to half the original attack of the monster sent to the graveyard. So essentially, the two were used with another card we talked about earlier on this list, Mechlord Emperor Weisel, which both fit the criteria of targets for the effect, but also was able to bring itself out if your monster is destroyed by a card effect. The last and most notable Gen X card that saw actual play was Gen X Ally Birdman, which was mainly used in Gallus the Star Beast FTKs, which used a loop with Birdman's effect to return a face-up monster to the hand, and Koaki Mirror Doom's effect to negate Birdman's effect to make an infinite damage loop with Gallus the Star Beast's burn effect constantly returning to the hand and being able to use over and over. This actually got Birdman sent to the ban list for a bit, where it's still limited to this day. Despite how bad Gen X controller was in the TCG, it was actually limited in Duel Links for its use with the Christian cards. The Christian cards would be used with Gen X Undyne as a deck thinner to start Christian combos by sending either Thirstvern, Sulfnir, or Praise Turtle to the graveyard with its foolish bear-like effect to then start special summoning other Christian monsters. So despite being the core member of one of the worst archetypes in the game, somehow, by some miracle, some players found use for it. 
To end with an attempt at saving grace is the fact that Gen X Controller is tied for the most listed tuner monster currently in the game, alongside Junk Synchro at 5 monsters. Alright, and that's our list for this episode of the unknown side of Yu-Gi-Oh! Are there any other obscure or new cards you'd like to see in this series? If so, let us know down in the comments below.